Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring with loving zeal. The poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn, whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the Redeemed at countless cost from our despair. Hello, welcome to our Bible study. My name is Clint McElroy, and today we'll be in John chapter 8. We will be meeting today at 10 a.m., so please join us if you can. Masks will be provided at the door for anyone who needs one. If you're sick in any way, please don't come up to the auditorium, but stay home and enjoy the streaming service instead. You're also welcome to join us at 9 a.m. to watch this Bible study on the large screen in the auditorium. We want to offer this English Standard Version Bible from the World Bible School to everyone who wants one. If you'd care to have one, please notify our church office and we'll make arrangements to get you one. We have a list of folks that we want to keep in our prayers for medical concerns that include Marjorie Vickers, Caroline Willard, Bobby Chennault, Cookie Hogan, and Emma Richardson. The list is long, so please take a look at the church bulletin for more details. I am in Florida. This uh, is not my home. This is where I'm staying while I'm in Florida. The sound is a little off on this recording, and I apologize for that. I will try to remedy that in future recordings, but we're going to make do for today. We want to remember the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus who were joined by a third man on the way. When he left their company, when they got to their destination, they realized while he'd been with them, there'd been a burning in their hearts. And that was an indication to them that he was the Christ. We hope to kindle that fire that they felt in their hearts, in our own hearts, by engaging in these studies of God's word together. We also want to remember the admonition from Leviticus 19, to be holy for the Lord your God is holy. And how can we be holy if we don't know what holiness is? We go to the scripture to find out what holiness is. And we make modifications to our own behaviors in order to do these things that God would have us do. We also want to remember the story of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and the prophet that came to Jeroboam. Again, it's a very important of these stories. I think Jeroboam's is probably the most important in that he purposely went about doing those things that were incorrect before God. And his sin led Israel into sin for centuries uh, from the his time until the time of Christ the people of Israel went up to the high places in the mountains to worship God there instead of going into Jerusalem to worship him appropriately and this was uh, an abomination to God and a, and a terrible sin visited upon the people that did that but also I uh, always bring up the points about the prophet that came to Jeroboam to warn him that he was doing something wrong the story of the prophet is most troubling to me as a teacher because he believed a lie on his way home from doing what God had told him to do. And that lie or that belief in that lie cost him his life. We need to take very good care that the things that we entrust to our lives as following God are consistent with those things that God has said. And that's the admonition of that story. But it's a uh, far-reaching one. We have to be very careful where we go to for guidance on what God has said, and I believe that that should be rooted in a study of God's Word. Whatever you hear from any man or from any other source, take it to God's Word and compare it to what you find there, and then do what you find in God's Word. Don't concern yourself with a message that comes from a stranger or someone who tells you that they're your friend. They may be lying to you, and you don't know the only way to find out is to go to God and find out from him directly. And you can. The scripture is there for that very purpose, to guide us into understanding what God's will is for us. So I hope you will join me today as we engage in this study of 
the first part of John chapter 8. The first part of John chapter 8 is parenthetically entered into the English Standard Version because it is not sourced from the earliest manuscripts available. And I do want to talk about that topic, but more important is the doctrine that's contained in this passage, and we will spend some time focusing on that. From the English Standard Version, we'll be starting with verse 53 of John chapter 7, as it is part of the omitted part of the earliest manuscripts. They went each to his own house, chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Verse 5, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse 8, and once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Okay, so last time we finished up chapter 7, so we'll review that again. In the first part of chapter 7, Jesus is in Galilee uh, because he was basically wanted in the rest of Judea. The Jews were seeking to kill him because of the things he'd been teaching. And it was the Feast of the Booths, so Jesus' brothers were kind of giving him a hard time asking him why he wouldn't go to Judea and start teaching so that the people would hear his teachings. They were doing this because it says that they did not believe in him. Jesus responded to them in verse 6, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. And then they went on up to the feast, and he indicated that he would not be going because his time had not yet come. And he remained in Galilee. After his brothers had gone up to the feast, he went privately up to the feast as well. And indeed, the Jews were looking for him there, saying, where is he? And some in the crowd were saying he's a good man, while others were saying, no, he leads people astray. But no one would speak very openly about him because they were afraid of the Jews who were searching for him. So we understand that uh, when an authority is looking for someone, we kind of clam up about information about that, if, unless you really want to be caught up in an investigation or imp even implicated in one. We have a tendency to be quiet about things that in other situations we would very much want to be heard about. Uh, so the people here in Jerusalem were in fear of these Jews who were seeking Jesus, in fear of them because they did indeed know that they sought to not just take him but kill him. This they knew inherently even if they didn't know it explicitly. But about halfway through the feast in verse 14, we see that Jesus went into the temple and began teaching in the open. Uh, the Jews marveled, amazed that he knew anything to teach. Where has he studied? Jesus responded, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. So he made it clear that those in the crowd who were interested in whether or not Jesus was authorized to do the things he was doing already knew because of the things he was doing that he was in fact authorized to do it, whether they wanted to acknowledge it or not. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. When we go about seeking God's will, we're not doing so for our own glory. We're doing it because God needs his will taught to the people. And when we instruct righteously, we do so without concern of our own appearance and our, of our own glory. We do so for the glory of God. And when God is properly glorified, he will lift up those uh, who serve him. So this is an interesting concept uh, and way of thinking about serving God. Certainly, uh, there are many who seek to serve God in, in an open 
fashion that brings glory to themselves, and it's not hard to find these kinds of folks. They were spoken of in the New Testament as well, and it was not in a positive way. So we need to take care of those who do those kinds of things in an open and self-glorifying way. Jesus goes on in verse 19, Has not Moses given you the law, and yet none of you keeps it? I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answered, What do you have, a demon? Nobody's trying to kill you. Knowing full well that the reason why they had not been speaking openly about Jesus was because they feared the Jews, and they knew that the Jewish authorities there had a hate out for Jesus that was murderous. They knew this. Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers, referencing the fact that Abraham was the one who had that covenant with God. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Now, I wanted to make sure I read that because I think that's key to today's passage as well. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So Jesus makes this argument plain. Uh, you know, you do what's necessary on the Sabbath day because it is according to the law. If the law prohibits regular work on Sabbath day, then you don't do regular work. But if you're doing something for the benefit of someone's health or for someone's standing before God, such as circumcision, then you go ahead and you do those things on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath does not pro prohibit what is necessary. It only prohibits what is unnecessary. So these things should have been understood by the people, and yet they were willing to make excuse and justify their accusations against Jesus because of this thing that Jesus had done on the Sabbath. So going on in verse 25, the people recognize, is this not the man who they seek to kill? So again, they knew full well that the Jews were seeking to kill Jesus. It's not a mystery. And it was not untrue what Jesus was saying about the people there, the Jewish authorities there. And he's speaking op openly and saying, and they're saying nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? And I made the assertion that indeed, I personally believe they all full well knew that this was the Christ. They just didn't like it. They didn't like that the Jesus, that uh, the Christ was coming in this form. He had more than demonstrated uh, his authority through his miracles and through the knowledge that he exhibited. He was doing those things that the Christ would have been doing. And at this point, even if they didn't believe, they should have been investigating the rest of it. They should have been asking the questions about his origins that they failed to ask. They instead made excuses. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord he who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. Uh, many people believed in him, and they said as, an, as a justification, when the Christ appears in verse 31, will he do more signs than this man has done? So that's, that's, that's telling to me. The people who were not trained as the scribes and Pharisees were trained we're asking this very simple question. If the Christ did appear, would he do more than this man has done? That was the right question to ask. They should have been seeking to find further proofs and validations of the prophecies, but they didn't do that. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things and they called for officers to arrest Jesus. Jesus uh, says in response, apparently to the officers that came to arrest him, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? And again, I made the assertion that, yeah, <laughs> that is what he was going to do, but not uh, in the way that they were saying it here. Jesus was going to be resurrected into heaven and in that location, they, they would not be able to go and find him there. But in fact, that action would lead to the church going out to the dispersion among the Greeks and they would teach both those Jews that were in 
the Greek world and the Greeks themselves about the promise of God and welcome them into that promise. But they were puzzled by all these things. So on the last day of the feast, they had not yet arrested him. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, in other places, it doesn't really explain why he's doing this, but here it does in verse 39. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were, were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So that's at least a partial explanation about why Jesus was doing these things. These teachings were not understood by anybody well enough to say that they could truly understand them. But he was laying the truth out there, and when the Spirit did come, it would give them comfort and it would help them understand these things that Jesus had been teaching at this early point. So some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? So they finally hit on this one point that they did know. They thought they knew, and, I, and, I, and I'm mixing my statements there. They didn't know. But they thought they knew that Jesus was from Galilee because that's where his family lived. That's where he lived. And they assumed that he was from Galilee. Does not the scripture say that Christ will come from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people. Some wanted to arrest him, but others would, uh, would not lay hand on him. The officers came to the chief priests and were asked, why have you not brought him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered, Have you been deceived as well? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. But Nicodemus, who had gone to him before from chapter 3, but it's referencing the statement here in verse 50, said in verse 51, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and, and learning what he does? But they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So indeed, no prophet arises from Galilee. But that doesn't mean that a prophet doesn't live in Galilee. Arises from Galilee would infer that he was born in Galilee, and Jesus was not born in Galilee. We know that from the other Gospels. So that ends that uh, chapter. We see that Jesus is laying out truths before the people that they do not understand, but he's doing miracles and speaking with authority in such a way that it is more than apparent to everyone that he was indeed the prophet. The Christ that they understood would be the prophet. They did not understand the whole nature of the Messiah. They understood some things, but mostly they did not understand that. He was not coming to be this great redeeming king of Israel in Israel. He was coming for a different kingdom altogether. And this was not understood by any of these folks at this time. So there was uh, there was a little a little bit of play there in, in the way that Jesus is behaving throughout the Gospels. When he's talking to people, he's explaining things that we understand because we have the whole story. They did not have the whole story. And as a result, they were unable to understand these things that were being presented to them. So then we go on into verse 53. They each went to his own house, which is an interesting uh, little thing. And I, I believe we'll find that this is a verse that we see in other passages that have this omission component. Uh, I'm not sure if that's significant anyway. I'm going to have to do more looking into that. But going on into chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Apparently he was, uh, at least according to this passage, staying in the Mount of Olives during the evenings. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, I'm not sure, but I pretty sure that adultery requires at least two people. So they bring one person who was caught in, a, caught in adultery. Where's the other person? That's my first question about this whole passage. It takes two, at least two, to commit adultery. And yet they only bring the woman who had been caught in adultery. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, 
Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? So indeed, if you go back to the law of Moses, uh, aside from the initial law saying that no one should commit adultery, in Leviticus we find that the solution for one found in adultery would be that the adulterer and the adulteress would be killed. They would be, their lives would be forfeit for this action of adultery. This they said to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Now, we don't know what he wrote on the ground, and I'm not sure that it matters. I think more importantly, it shows a casual disregard for the serious charges that were being laid before him about this person. Uh, they brought no witness. At least we don't hear anyone truly saying that they were a witness to these events, and they didn't bring the second party and I'm sure that these things had to be on the mind of anyone who was truly looking to take a true legal action against someone for adultery. They continued to ask him, and he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. That's, uh, that's it. I mean, that's the story. Who among us has any right to condemn anyone else for their sin? Each of us has committed our own sins that we have to answer for, and we can't. There's nothing we can bring that would absolve us of the sins that we've committed, the responsibility of those sins, the damages done by those sins. We can't undo those things before God. We can't undo those things in the hearts of those we've sinned against. We can't fix it. Sin is beyond our ability to fix. So when he brings this charge back against them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. That's a serious thing. And I don't know how any man would have been able to stand a moment longer, let alone as long as it seemed to take uh, for the rest of this to play out. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And that makes sense. The oldest of us certainly know that we have committed sins that, that uh, we have deep regret about, and we remember those sins. We may have gone to God and asked his forgiveness and been covered by the blood of Christ already. Certainly these men had not done that, but we may have done that, and yet we still live with the guilt of those sins on our shoulders and in our minds, knowing full well that we cannot truly undo the sin. But we can go to God, and that is an important point that we want to uh, follow up on when we're done with the rest of this passage. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now that's an incredible statement. He is not going to hold her condemned for this thing that she's been brought to him for. What a glorious thing it is to be forgiven for the sins we are guilty of. It is a wonderful, glorious thing. I'm sure she felt that in that moment. No one of her condemners who were ready to kill her a moment before remained. And Jesus didn't demand anything of her. He said, I condemn you, go. But he did ask her and said, I guess you could make this a conditional thing, go and from now on, sin no more. That's the charge to us. Your sins are forgiven if you've gone to Christ and repented and been baptized and been covered in that blood and resurrected from baptism to newness of life. We are spotless at that point. Go and sin no more. You've done nothing to be free from the sins that you've committed, but God has freed you. Go and sin no more. That is to be holy before the Lord. Go and be holy for the Lord your God is holy. Take that charge seriously. It's an admonition. It's a real thing. We should be trying to live holy lives before the Lord. Now we're going to mess up. That's not the point. The point is we should be trying to be holy. When we mess up that blood that covers us from the sins that we have already committed will continue to cover us. It's a matter of staying true to the desire to be holy before the Lord. Be faithful in that desire. Be faithful in the efforts to be holy before the Lord. 
and we ex enjoy this wonderful benefit. It is the key, I believe, to much of our doctrine, if not all of it, that we are forgiven. The Lord has forgiven us. We should not stand in condemnation of others. We should be sharing that forgiveness with others. It's a glorious, wondrous gift that we can give to anybody caught in that same web of deceit and lies, telling themselves that they can't be forgiven. They can't forgive themselves. They can't be forgiven by anybody in this world for the sins they've committed, but they can be forgiven by God. They can be absolved of the consequences of that sin on an eternal scale. Now, we have to live with the consequences of our sins in this life, but in the life that is to come, we will be spotless. We will be as we were when we were resurrected into newness of life, covered by the blood of Christ. What a wonderful story that is. And certainly we could expound on that for quite some time. But in the English Standard Version, I don't know if you can see it here, but there is a parenthetical wrap around that whole passage. And it talks about how the earliest manuscripts do not include this passage. And that may be true. The earliest manuscripts that we can find do not have this passage in them. So what do we do? The rule that says that the earliest manuscripts are more likely to be more accurate and true is certainly a good rule to hold when doing translations in general. But why have they included this one parenthetically in this passage while they leave out other passages ex completely that are also absent from early manuscripts? Well, I believe it's because they too understand that this passage is important. This is a key passage, a key doctrine that uh, is pivotal to the way we believe in and should be behaving. So I believe that's why the translators probably left this in the passage. I haven't studied that. I haven't made any explicit study into that, but that would make sense to me. So why would, uh, why would it be missing? There's really only two options about this passage. There is the reality where John actually wrote this passage in the original manuscripts and there's the reality where John didn't write this passage in the original manuscripts. So let's look at the second. So if John didn't write this passage in the original manuscripts and it's included and it's included here in error, then what can we say about this passage? Is it in and of itself erroneous? Is this not a teaching that is consistent with God's word? I believe that it is consistent with God's word in every imaginable application here. So I don't see that this is a problem from that perspective. It is simply a, a problem in that the writer of this book did not write this passage and, and instead it was included by someone else at a later date to help possibly explain uh, the rest of this doctrine, which is consistent with the rest of this this area of the scripture, judge with right judgment. And the stuff that's further into chapter eight is also consistent with this teaching. So in that regard, this teaching is not inappropriate. It would simply then be a matter of whether or not this event actually took place, which may also be a factor in why it's not in the earliest manuscripts. Perhaps this was a, a witness to count from someone else who was present with John at this point and Jesus and saw these things unfold and they wanted it included from another writing or perhaps a different writing of John. So that's one explanation for why it might not be in the original manuscripts. Going to the other option, John did write this in the earliest manuscript, his original manuscript, which no one has. And we can't prove that he wrote it, but he did in fact write it. Let's just say that that's the case. If that's the case, why would it be missing from the earliest manuscripts we can find? Well, there's several answers for that and rooted in my way of thinking is factionalism. So we know at the earliest points of the church, factionalism started. Uh, people started attributing their beliefs to different teachers and then some people taught absolute error and some people taught things that were not far from the truth. And there were people doing all manner of things to try to justify themselves. And certainly the 
book that we know of as the New Testament did not exist, and there had been no authoritative action taken to create such a book. The individual letters existed, and the components of the book existed as they were written, and so different groups had access to different copies of these books and letters, and they would, among their own scribes, copy those things and distribute them to other congregations of the Lord's Church. And eventually, a number of years will go by, and a council of church elders assembles, and they assemble this book that we know of as the canon, the Bible, and they include different writings from different churches that each had origins from different locations. So it was an amalgam of various sources that they brought together and put into the Holy Scripture and canonized as authoritative. Now, there were groups that didn't agree with that, and there were groups who had different agendas for doctrinal points that would have stood against that canon. So why would you expect there to be any difference even years before? And that's my contention, that perhaps the earliest script that we're finding, manuscripts that we're finding that don't have this passage in them, if indeed John did write this passage, may have been written by groups that did not like this teaching, particularly, I'm guessing, about adultery. They did not want people to think that adulterers could uh, go about living amongst them without being condemned. And Certainly, uh, the Judaizing Christians would have had issues with this because in the old law, it was very explicit and it was among the other condemnations that warranted death. Adulterers and adulteresses should be killed. They should not be tolerated to live among the people. So in that regard, I think it's perfectly obvious that a group who held such beliefs would readily remove this passage from uh, the manuscripts that they were copying and passing around to other people. They would very readily remove it. There was no admonition in this letter that things couldn't be added to or removed from. That admonition's in Revelation and did not necessarily extend to this book in their minds. It does in my mind, but it doesn't necessarily apply to them. So the removing of this passage may not have been on the point of forgiveness but simply the point of tolerating adulterers in their midst. And we know sexual immorality was rampant in the early church. There was a problem with that because the Greeks practiced sexual immorality as part of the religion, and, and it was a problem. And it certainly it never stops being a problem. So that uh, makes some sense to me. I, I don't know that it makes sense to you, but I thought I would share that, why this passage might not be in the book, even though it may still have been written by the hand of John and his original writings. Now, I don't know either way, but either way, I do believe the doctrines contained here are sound. They're consistent with the rest of the passage, and I believe this event is very likely to have occurred. So I don't have any problem with it being here. Traditionally, we have used it and taught this as the grounds for our disposition of forgiveness toward those who've sinned against us and those who've sinned and may want to be part of our groups. We have to have a forgiving heart toward those who want to repent and serve God. We don't know that this woman really wanted to repent of her sin. We don't know the rest of the story about this woman. We only know what we know from this passage. I hope you found a word of encouragement in this. Uh, maybe you can understand why I have some issues with the uh, the rule of thumb about removing passages from the Bible that don't show up in our earliest copies of manuscripts of the source material. We don't have the originals, so we can't say that just because something's not in an early manuscript that it's not part of the original. It may have been restored to later manuscripts because earlier people found earlier copies of the letters that indeed had the stories and they restored them to the passages. We don't have their translation notes, so we don't know. We can only assume, and so we have to take care about removing passages, especially key passages like this one today, from translations because we can't find 
them in the earliest manuscripts. I'm in Florida. I will be here for a while, so uh, I'll con continue to try to develop this process so that it's less annoying with the audio. But I'm, I hope that you found something encouraging today in today's message. We will be assembling today. I won't be there, but perhaps you can go and assemble with the church at 10 a.m. If you're sick in any way, please don't go up to the church building, but stay home instead and enjoy the streaming service. God bless. Have a great week.